In part three of this talk, we will focus on the first two of the four common theories of communication and behavior. Those are reasoned action and social learning. Before we focus on each of those, I'd like to give you an overview. Now, there are many theories available to health communication researchers and practitioners, but there are four that are very commonly used. The rest of this section will focus on those. These four theories ultimately share an emphasis on individual behavior, but emphasize different factors, different predictors, or combinations of factors that influence behavior. The four theories are the theory of reasoned action, or a newer variation on that called the theory of planned behavior. We sometimes refer to these as TRA or TPB. And these theories focus primarily on cognitive or rational processes around decision making. Fear management or risk management theory is particularly relevant for some health issues like HIV AIDS prevention. This theory, sometimes called the extended parallel process model, focuses on how cognition and emotion work together in parallel to motivate behavior. Observational learning or social learning focuses on how people learn to behave by observing other people and comparing those other people to their own personal situation. And finally, the diffusion of innovations, which in some ways is the most social of these theories, focuses on the structure of the social environment, for example, on neighborhoods and networks, and how these influence access to information and the behavioral response to that information. Because I'm trained in a communication and science tradition, I consider some of the theories that come out of public health, like the health belief model and Prochaska's stages of change model, which is based on the practice of psychiatry, I consider them to be more recent reformulations of older, well-established communication theories. So I don't include them in my list of core theories. But if you're familiar with these and you prefer to use them, you certainly can. Any theories are helpful in developing a behavior change communication strategy. What's important is to consider the, the unique characteristics or unique factors that each theory describes and use your theories in a practical way to help you understand the behavior of your audience. One helpful way to organize these theories is along a continuum from theories that focus more on individuals to theories that focus more on societal structures or on networks, on communities, for example. And I've shown how the four core theories can be arranged in this way. Reasoned action tends to be more individual. Fear management tends to be more individual. But observational learning and diffusion of innovations tend to be more social and structural. So you should choose a theory that matches the context of the behavior you're trying to influence. Let's start with the theory of reasoned action, or the theory of planned behavior. The basic assumptions of this theory are that people make decisions thoughtfully or rationally. And those decisions are based on what people expect will happen to them if they choose a particular action. Will good things happen? Will bad things happen? Will they feel inconvenienced? Will they feel confident and happy about the decision that they have made? Those decisions are also based on what people think others want them to do, or in fact what other people do around them. And they base those decisions in part on what makes it harder or easier to act. One of the key parts of the theory of reasoned action and the theory of planned behavior is a belief. What is a belief? A belief is information about a person or an object or an issue, and it may be a fact or it may be merely opinion. For example, Barack Obama is blank. You fill in the blank. What do you believe about Barack Obama? What about bed nets? Bed nets are blank, convenient, safe, useful, protective. What about sit-ups? Doing sit-ups every day will what? Make your stomach muscles tighter? Whatever you fill in the blank with is your belief about that object. Another important part of reasoned action is the attitude. What is an attitude? It's a positive or a negative feeling about a person, an object, or an issue. What are your feelings about Barack Obama? Do you like him? Do you not like him? What about bed nets? What about doing sit-ups? I know I don't particularly like doing sit-ups, but I do them anyway because I think they're good for my health. But your attitude is a positive or negative feeling about that object. 
And these can affect the way that you respond to a behavior because it makes it more attractive or less attractive. According to the theory of reasoned action and its newer version, the theory of planned behavior, people base their intentions on two main things, their attitudes toward the behavior, that is whether performing the behavior is a good thing or a bad thing to do, and their subjective norms regarding the behavior, that is whether other people around you are performing it and think that you should too. The theory of planned behavior adds one more piece to the model. But in both of these, beliefs about the behavior are based on whether or not you think the behavior will lead to certain outcomes and what you think of those outcomes. Are they desirable or undesirable? For example, what will happen if I sleep under a bed net? Will it be too hot to sleep? Or will I sleep better knowing that I'm safe from mosquito bites? How I feel about those possible outcomes affect my attitude toward bed net use. Subjective norms are affected by what I think other people who are important to me, like my friends, my family, my neighbors, maybe my clergy or religious leader in the community, other community leaders perhaps, what they think I should do and whether or not I feel compelled to follow their preferences. For example, will my wife want us to sleep under a bed net? Does she want our children to? How strongly am I motivated to do what she wants me to do? Now, for some behaviors, the attitude part, what you believe will happen as a result of the behavior, is more important than the subjective norm part. For other behaviors, the normative part is more important. Often norms are more important when the behavior is a social one, such as contraceptive use or recycling, or perhaps malaria eradication in the community. Research can help determine which one, which of these factors, beliefs or norms, is more likely to influence the behavior in question. Now, as I said, the theory of planned behavior adds another piece to this model. It adds the idea that some behaviors may not be under our control. There may be things that stand in your way, even if you want to do something. For example, can I get an insecticide-treated net if I want one? Does the local clinic have malaria prophylaxis drugs? Can I get my wife to the clinic three times during pregnancy for her to receive treatment for malaria? These things and what you believe about them also influence your motivation. If you feel helpless to perform a behavior, your intention to act will be lower. Now we can use TRA or TPB in a lot of ways to help us think through the reasons that our audience may or may not take healthy action regarding malaria. We can use it to develop messages that affect beliefs, that influence our perceptions of what others think or want us to do, and our control beliefs, and so on, so that we can use it to identify who our primary audience is, who has influence over them, and how we should position our communication in a way that people will be convinced or motivated to adopt the behavior. If we go back to our story about the mother on the eastern coast of Tanzania, what would the reasoned action narrative sound like? The story begins the same way. Once upon a time, there was a young mother who lived on the eastern coast of Tanzania. She had a one-year-old daughter, but a year earlier, her one-year-old son had died of a fever, and she didn't know why, and so on and so on. The reasoned action part of the story might go like this. Recently, the young woman's sister told her that when a baby has fever, it should be tested at the clinic to determine what causes the fever and what kind of medicine to take. She said that when her own son had fever, a nurse told her about the test and helped her treat her son so that his fever went away. But the young woman was worried about whether the test was safe, and she was worried about the cost of the medicine. Her friend, who also had a daughter, told her that, oh, all fevers are the same, and there was a lot of cheap medicine that you could get for fever. She advised going to the chemist instead of getting her baby tested first. But the young woman knew that her sister cared deeply for her and cared about her daughter, too, and she valued her sister's advice. So in spite of her doubts, she decided to follow her sister's suggestion. She went to the clinic for the test and got the malaria medicine for her daughter, whose fever stopped, and she grew stronger. So this theory emphasizes the beliefs about what will happen if you adopt the behavior. The woman was worried about cost. She was worried about the safety of the medicine. And her friend was trying to convince her not to practice this behavior because there were lots of cheaper solutions. 
But the woman listened to the advice of her sister instead because she knew her sister cared about them and she valued the input of her sister. So it was her sister, the subjective norms of the people around her, that carried the day, that convinced her that going to the clinic and getting the proper test and the proper medicine was the right thing to do. Our second theory, observational or social learning, was based on studies of how children learn aggressive behavior from watching others. In a series of experiments, Bandura and his colleagues showed that children who saw others behaving aggressively without being punished were likely to mimic or copy those aggressive behaviors. They did these studies in a preschool, in a nursery school. And they organized the experiment by having an adult come into the room and beat up on a plastic blow-up doll. These were called Bobo dolls. And you may have seen them. They're plastic dolls with a heavy weight in the bottom, so if you knock them over, they bounce back again. And the adult hit the Bobo doll with toys and said things like, sock him in the nose, knock him down, kick him. Oh, he keeps coming back for more. He sure is a tough fellow. And then after beating up on the doll, the adult left the room, and they watched what the children did. And as you can imagine, the children did exactly what the adult had done. They used the same toys to hit the doll, and they said the same things. Sock him in the nose, knock him down, kick him, pow, and so on. So this was evidence to Bandura and his colleagues that children could learn aggressive behavior by observing what other people did and whether or not they were punished for those actions. As they conducted more experiments, they introduced other variables into the study. For example, another adult would scold the first adult about their behavior and say something like, you shouldn't beat up on that poor doll. It's not nice. And they observed the children afterwards, and they discovered the children were less likely to perform the aggressive behavior if they saw the model had been scolded for that behavior. So basically, this theory says that people learn by observing what other people do by observing what happens to those people as a result of their behavioral choice. For example, are they rewarded or punished socially, materially, or even physically? Then they evaluate the relevance and the importance of those consequences for their own life and rehearse the behavior, usually first in their mind, mentally rehearsing the behavior, and then attempting to reproduce the action themselves if they feel confident or positive about it. The most common application of this theory is in modeling behaviors that we want people to adopt. That is, showing what happens to people who act in a certain way and demonstrating how to perform the behavior oneself. Just like reasoned action, we can use social learning to think about what motivates the behavior of our audience, about what messages could convince people to change and how to reward or reinforce the behavior once it starts so that it will continue. We can show the behavior in a visually simple way. We can encourage people to try the behavior. We can provide feedback to them when they make an attempt. And we can show how individuals support each other to practice that behavior and achieve the benefits that the behavior provides. How would you rewrite that care-seeking narrative about malaria in Tanzania from a social learning perspective. What would you focus on to tell that story? Let me give you a moment to think about that. So how would you rewrite the narrative from a social learning perspective? Perhaps you could tell how the, the young mother sees a neighbor going to the clinic and getting malaria medicine and what happens to their children as a result. She might recognize that those friends and neighbors are similar to her, and she might identify with them and with their family and with their children. And she might see that the children come home from the clinic and get better and don't have a fever as often as they used to, or not at all. So think about how you might use this theory to tell the story of the behavior of your audience. Let's take a short break and come back, and we'll talk about the second two theories of these four common ones that are used for communication and behavior change programs, diffusion and fear or risk management.